So, Tony. Yes. <laughs> on our Reddit, somebody asked a question, and this was during our break. So, this was actually 21 days ago, maybe even shortly before our break. I haven't been counting. And the question is about that. Well, first of all, this is from a user named Nameless Purity. He or she asks, about a reference we made in the podcast. I think it was probably me because I recognized the reference. It was um, to a study that had shown when you asked a group of people to make interesting collages and then you asked a different group of people in a different room to make the best collage and the most interesting one would get a prize, that it turns out the people who are just told to make an interesting one make much more interesting collages than those who are asked to compete with their fellow collage makers. And I, I like that study. I reference it a lot, actually. Um, it's in a book called No Contest. Subtitle is The Case Against Competition. And then, Tony, there is a sub-subtitle, Why We Lose in Our Race to Win. Uh, the author is Elfie Cohn. That's K-O-H-N. And he's an educational theorist. He's not uh, a Marxist or anything like that. He studies education and looks at educational policies and educational strategies, things like that. And in this particular book, he explored whether or not competition was helpful. And he looks at the at the larger society, but most of because he because he tries to kind of expand his work a little bit in this book. But most of the research as to whether or not competition is helpful or hurtful is in classroom settings. So most of it applies directly to education. And then he expands uh, outward from that a little bit. But in this book, there are tons of examples of studies and redone studies and even meta-analysis, which is the best kind of study. Do you know about meta-analysis? Yeah, I was uh, I was just looking at um, some meta analyses uh, about minimum wage increases. So oh, so I took one class in college that was about uh, studies and and like logical thinking. I think the class was called logical thinking, but it was mostly how to tell a good study from a bad study. And one of the biggest takeaways in that class is the best study is a meta-analysis because it compiles the results of many, many, many studies, all the studies on that topic that are available or, or that the researcher can find. Yeah. The problem with the meta-analysis is that you need a bunch of less good studies <laughs> to yeah. exist in the first place. Yeah, yeah. When you do your meta-analysis, you need to understand the difference between a bad study and a good study so you can include those which i guess was the helpful part of the rest of the class because we did a lot of uh figuring that out but um yeah the book has lots of examples of particular studies that are kind of interesting that um I, I find useful like the collage study i tried this morning to find which chapter the collage study was in i was just paging through the book i couldn't find it um so i'll just recommend the book it's it's quite a good book. If if you don't find it right away, if if you end up reading the whole book, then I don't feel bad because it's a wonderful book. And that's all my follow up on that. It was a large follow up. I know. Also, oh, that wasn't what I was going to say. What I was going to say is, it took me nearly that entire time to figure the the episode they're referring to. We talked about that, I believe. I called Red Education. And that was episode seven, season three of the podcast. Okay. By the way, speaking of seasons and episodes, I think this episode we should make the first episode of season four. That's a good idea. We did take a, a small break. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so we took a break, uh, not necessarily because we had been doing the podcast for a almost a year since the reboot in the longer format. We took a break really just for life reasons. Yeah. Uh, I had a baby, another baby. Yeah. I guess the other one's not a baby anymore. I had another child. There we go. Yeah. You're, that is the way you're adults say it. <laughs> twice a father. Yes. Now a three and a half year old in a uh, just over one month old. Awesome. Yeah. I saw the, the photo on Facebook of your newest child with his red diaper. And laying next to Capitol? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And me, I'm just, I just uh, am very busy at work right now, which it sounds like not nearly as important compared to the birth of a human being. But it also just means I have less time. So, uh,. Between those two factors, we needed to take a little time off. We're back now. And it's almost been a year since we rebooted, so I think this it makes sense to call this the beginning of Season 4. Yeah, at some point we might need to formalize or standardize when we have a season-like thing like that. Although it is kind of fun yeah. to just play it by ear and be like, ah, Season 5 today. <laughs> yeah. Season Maybe. 4, Episode 2 is Season 5, Episode 1. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Actually, we do have this weird thing where there are two two episodes, one of season three, because I started a third season, which then did not develop into anything more than one episode. And then we did the reboot and we decided one episode a season does not make. I thought we just retroactively called that episode zero. Oh. I, in my, I have a really pointless list of episodes we have and i have it as episode zero in my list okay i'm okay with that i like that now which means 20 episodes exactly in season three. Oh, because we went up we went from zero to 19 yep all right 20 episodes in a season is good additionally tony we have a second comment on this same thread uh that from a user named Psy1, who has commented on our Reddit before. By the way, if you want to leave a comment on our Reddit, we are at reddit.com slash Marxism today. Good segue. Thank you. Yeah, I snuck that in there. Uh, Psy1 writes about internet piracy, and he makes the observation that when media is pirated, we are actually putting the price closer to its actual exchange value or actual uh, value in labor of theory or, or labor theory of value terms. And I pretty much agree with him. I mean, there's, there's kind of two parts to media, right? There's the production of it, which does require a lot of labor, and the distribution of it, which now with the internet and digital formats is almost nothing. Here's something on that, um, and I don't know exactly where this is coming from. Uh, maybe it's because I've still yet to read Volume 3 of Capital, which is my summer goal. But I've heard it said a few times that Andrew Kleiman, or I think I've heard Andrew Kleiman say it, and people referring to Andrew Kleiman talking about that, there's no actual cost in the production of something original. It's the reproduction of a thing, which is where the actual creation of value lies. I'm not exactly sure where that comes from. That seems... Well, I would say it this way. Maybe, uh, tell me if this sounds like what you're thinking of. I would say it this way, that the production of an original thing, like the Mona Lisa, or a software program, right? Like, once it's created, you don't recreate that thing. Or if you do, it doesn't count as the same thing. Like in the case of the Mona Lisa, if I painted the Mona Lisa, that doesn't count. It's the one that's created by Leonardo that counts. Okay. Same thing with software in the sense that once I've programmed that program, it's just reproduced and the reproduction is easy at that point. Right. So these are kind of two extremes that fall into the same camp where either you cannot reproduce because the like initial reproduction of it is considered special or you can reproduce infinitely at essentially no cost. Those fall in the same camp where all of the labor is up front, 
right? Like the yeah. where district where reproduction can't come into the equation. And uh, from a labor theory of value point of view, some folks, I think this is Kleiman's point, some folks will say that that is priceless or valueless. Okay. In, 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 and I, th I like to use the word, uh, like maybe, maybe it's bad to say the word priceless because you can put a price on it. Price is what's there in the, in the market, but it, it can be valueless in the sense that you you can't reproduce it or you can reproduce it infinitely. Okay. And I don't think that's the same as saying it doesn't take labor to create or that that labor isn't valuable. And I I don't know what argument climate is making, but I assume that I'm going to have a favorable reading of him yeah. assuming that I'm I'm giving I'm assuming he's correct at whatever he means. I just need to get around to reading his books <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess I, I haven't see i'm gonna comment on this without reading the book but, <laughs> but yeah i think it's it's the and to me that's i don't know if that's totally satisfactory as a way to look at it like when it comes to a software application um, and I would be curious to know see this is not an area of marxism that i've read a lot of marxists take takes on i'd be curious to know what other marxists out there think my general idea i don't know what to do with the work of art yet still but when it comes to things like software i want to say whatever it would in general take for someone to program that right like a like a piece of software isn't necessarily unique like the mona lisa you know, it might be a little bit different if you program it versus some other programmer programs it, but a software that in general does X, Y, Z, how many hours would that take to produce? You know, like that's, that's a thing that people are figuring out now. That, Depends. Right? Like, yeah, like when, I mean, I'm sure so huge software companies are budgeting time for these big things and... I'm sure that they're, they might be wildly wrong sometimes, but, you know, eventually this will be a science to, like, be able to estimate with a decent degree of accuracy how long programming something takes. I don't know. You're closer to the programming world, so maybe you have a different opinion. I'm, I'm sure they're, they do have a way, a metric of figuring that out. I don't know it, though. Um, but I mean, I can tell you something like an operating system takes millions of man hours to do, probably. Or they have, you know, millions of lines of code. and if... So it, it takes a huge amount of, takes a lot of effort to do. I know um, for like Linux, which is open source, a lot of people work on it voluntarily. Um, there's like, I think they keep track somewhere. You can go look and see how long people have worked on it. I believe it had crossed like the million or billion mark a while, quite a while ago. So okay, yeah, it, it takes a long time, and especially when you it's is it creating it or is it updating it? You know, it's mm -hmm. things like that. But generally, I will say for like a simple program, like if you want me to make a little program that like you type your name in and it says "Hi Red," you know, mm -hmm. that takes like a minute. So. That's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think what you're getting at is that it's like, and so, there are there are ballparks that you can make. Yeah, but also, too, then we can get into the rabbit hole of its work built upon work. Because if I'm writing a high-level language, well, somebody wrote the compiler and the normally integrated development environment, and then somebody made that computer programming language mm -hmm. off of the assembly language that was made on the processor that was the processor was made. So. Yeah. But you know what? I think now that I'm thinking about it, the even though a piece of software is unique, like say it's, it's like a video game, right? Because there are lots of video games, but each video game is unique. Mm -hmm. I mean... That's not so different than like certain other commodities that are are unique in a certain way, but are each different from each other. Like um, a can of beer from a different brewery is different than than each other, right? 
but at a certain level, it's just a can of beer, right? Where mm. okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might be too picky about my beer. Do depending agree with on that. who you are, but you can uh, well whatever commodity you care about, then like uh, a bundle of asparagus no, get, get in a grocery mean. store, you know, from one farmer to another might be a little bit different, but. On a certain level, it's just a bundle of asparagus. A bottle of asparagus? A bundle. Oh, they said a bottle of a asparagus. Bottle. A bottle of liquid asparagus. Mmm. <laughs> That's a good way to get your vitamins. <laughs> that that sounds absolutely disgusting. Yeah. I guess so, that's a long way to say, yes, we agree. It doesn't have a value because it... Or, the value is very close to zero because it's so easily reproducible. Yeah, certainly the value of distribution. I yeah. think that's the easy part, is the, is the distribution of the media once it's created, we, we all agree, is uh, essentially zero. The value of the initial creation of the product, that I think is a little trickier. You know, you've got um, the answer that Kleiman gives and I don't know if that's his probably I assume that that's like an old answer that's come from long ago maybe maybe not but um I don't know I think that I think the initial creation of the object is a little bit tougher I'd love to know what people think if you have an idea if you have an opinion um the uh how the labor theory of value should apply to the initial creation of a unique item that can be never reproduced or infinitely reproduced, please leave a comment on our subreddit. Well, that's all. Those are the two things I have for follow-up. So as many, hopefully everybody who listens to this podcast is aware, uh, Bernie Sanders has announced he is running for president. Bernie Sanders has been the longtime uh, senator from Vermont, independent senator, Meaning Norm. that he's not a Democrat or a Republican. Right, and he caucuses with the Democrats. He and is... I don't even know what that means. It sounds like he's going on Oregon Trail to me. Yeah, he... I don't exactly know what that means either. It basically means that, like, I think he goes to, like, their conventions and stuff. But import the... I guess I don't know exactly what it means. But the implication is is that he can get placed on a committee because political committee or congressional committees are ridiculous in the amount of power they have, mm -hmm. ridiculous in their undemocraticness, and as a result of that is that he caucuses with the Democrats, because otherwise he as an independent would never get placed on a committee. Oh. Because you have to, it's, the parties get to decide who gets to be in what committee, which is why you have absolutely ridiculous things like the uh, House and Senate uh, committees on like science and stuff, are run by a bunch of people who don't believe in climate change and stupid things like that hmm. and who deny basic facts about things that are pretty scientifically well accepted. Wow. Or you get people like uh, Daryl Isaiah, who is the House Oversight Committee, I think. I don't know. He's on a committee where basically he's the chairperson and as chair, you can basically decide, you get to decide what legislation just even gets brought to committee, which all legislation has to go to committee before it can go to the House or the Senate. So as the chair of a committee like that, Daryl Isaiah, who is a very anti-post office and was one of the people who was responsible for the post office ridiculous, you must fund the next 75 years of your health care immediately, which is why the post office is doing so poorly, is because of that ridiculous requirement. Otherwise, they're doing just fine. Uh, he and I gets, don't think I don't think we've talked about that on the no show. We haven't. But he uh, gets to then go. Oh nope, we will not even consider in committee any legislation that gets rid of this because he can just do that, and it is probably well maybe the electoral college is the least democratic thing we have in this country. It's one of the <laughs> least democratic things we have in our quote unquote democracy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, that's the that's the point of caucusing as a Democrat. But Bernie Sanders is actually running as uh, on the Democratic Party ticket. Well, I don't know if that means he's officially a member of the Democratic Party for this, or I've seen it both ways, and I'm quite confused on this point. 
Um, but he's running against Hillary Clinton in the Democrat primary, which... Are, uh, are they the only two right now? As far as I know, they are. Because yeah. it's been the inevitable Hillary is going to be president. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about Bernie running uh, under the Democrats. I wanted him to run as a third-party candidate. But I can also see the strategic value in running as a Democrat. Mm-hmm. Especially some with him. I know there's a little worry that, or there's some, a good bit of worry actually, by some people about his message being co opted by the corporations who control the Democrats, which I don't think he would be corrupted or co opted by it, but it hurts his messaging a bit, I think. That, you know, it's hard to be an anti corporate candidate when the party that you're running on the presidential ticket on is very mm. heavily steep in, in the corporate stuff. But yep, I see what you're saying. I, I think I, I think that's more of a surface argument against him. I and mean, it strategically makes sense because he can run as a democratic socialist, as he is still happily calling himself. Yeah, I was I was excited to see that that he was not shying away from being a democratic socialist in recent interviews. Yeah. So that's good. But he can run as that and not have to worry about the normal third party worry is that is well a vote for, you know, Nader or whoever is really a vote for the Republicans because it splits the Democrat ticket because again, our democracies really quite undemocratic and really, really just stacked terribly against me. So I like it from that strategic standpoint. I also don't like that it has to be a strategic choice that gets made. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I'm excited. Although I would even say that I don't know if I would necessarily call Sanders a democratic socialist. He, I think... To me, the key distinction, why well, I would probably normally call him a, a social democrat mm-hmm. versus a democratic socialist is that he's not advocating for the overthrow of the capitalist system, yep. but really reforms, which reforms could be a starting point to more things that lead to an overthrow, mm-hmm. but he's not calling for the abolition of the capitalist system. I agree with you. Yeah, but uh, I think in order to really be a socialist, whether you're revolutionary or democratic or whatever kind of socialist you want to call yourself, to really be a socialist, you need to support an economic system that is distinct and different from capitalism. And and we've talked a little bit about what, what we think that might look like in previous episodes. We won't get into that now, but that's not what Bernie does. However, I think... I'm not sure that someone in his position could. No. No, I don't think he could. Either. Yeah, that's another thing about it is that you can't have – you couldn't have Lenin running <laughs> for president. <laughs> yeah. At, at least not in this country at this time. I guess I won't rule out the idea that somebody could run as uh, as against capitalism. I mean, it happens in other countries well, where candidates can run for political party – saying that they are against capitalism. Syriza. Yes, exactly. Uh, I don't think that that's probably a possibility on the presidential national level in the U.S. Yeah. Clearly, we have we have examples of it. We've, we've had socialist mayors in the past, and even here in Wisconsin, we've seen socialist mayors. But more recently, the, everyone's favorite socialist to bring up, Kashama Sawant in the, the Seattle area. Yeah who uh, is is very clearly against capitalism, member of Socialist Alternative. Um, but I, I, I think that Bernie is about as close as conceivably possible to run and and still have at least some degree of national attention. Obviously, like, the Socialist Party and there's a couple of Socialist Parties that sometimes get... Uh, candidates on the ballot in certain states um and and they will will have you know very strong socialist views often i think bernie is the closest we can hope to have 
as a socialist. I mean, he calls himself a socialist. I support the things that he stands for in general. I mean, maybe not every little thing, but the as far as, you know, if I had to line up the, the politicians in the House and the Senate and say which ones I like the best, he would be very close to the top. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really very excited about his, his, uh, declaring his run, uh, because it means I now know who I'm going to vote for in the primaries. Yeah. Because I really, I, I don't think I'll vote for Clinton. I don't, I have no idea who's going to run against her before this. Now I know I have at least the Bernie choice. Probably I'll be surprised if a Democrat that I like better than Bernie runs in the primary. I can't imagine voting in the Republican primary. And, um, most third parties don't have a very big primary. You're not going to vote for our, uh, our governor? Hmm. <laughs> I would like to get him out of the state, so that would be one way. Yeah, but then we have Clyfish to deal with. Mm, and yes. She's worse than he is in some ways. Yep. If not every way. <laughs> and and speaking of which, exciting news for Wisconsin. Uh, not to get all Wisconsin on the podcast, but we will right now. Is Russ Feingold is going to run against Ron Johnson? Did you see that? I did see that. Yeah, to reclaim his seat that he inexplicably lost to the empirically most useless senator. Ron, I don't know if you've seen that. Ron Johnson, like, they do studies of, like, who's the least effective and who does the least. Uh-huh. Ron Johnson has consistently, since he's been in there, has been number one. I That doesn't surprise me. I have not seen that. But he had literally no substance. He, he had a funny commercial where, like, his family made fun of him. And then all his other commercials... Were the only thing that he had against Russ Feingold was that while Russ Feingold was in the Senate, the national debt increased by this much. Well, there were lots of people in the Senate and the House and the presidency during that entire time, including George Bush in the presidency. If that's the only thing you have against a candidate is like the same thing that you could say for literally every politician, then you have nothing to run on. And so, with basically no message at all, he won, which was, I, I was He was riding the, the Tea that. Party train. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was the right timing, for sure. He he was very good at timing. No, but, I did But I'm that, excited to see Russ run against him, because Russ is, uh, is again, he, he doesn't need, no, you know, maybe it doesn't fit into this podcast, because he doesn't use the word socialism at all. No, he's but not a socialist. He is a politician that, if if I'm forced to pick ones that I like, he is is at the top of the list. Yeah, he's a very strong, progressive candidate. Yep. Which, you know, with options in electoral politics... That's often the best you can hope for. So, yeah, it's another reason why Bernie's exciting is because he's more than just a progressive. He's actually advocating for a break with politics as they are, but in a non-rhetorical way, like Obama is. Mm-hmm. I think that's another barrier to overcome is that Obama came and promised change and something different, and we got much more of the same. Mm-hmm. Not even the same of, like, Democrats, but the same of, like, George W. Bush, who was before him. Yeah. In large ways, the though their uh, presidencies are a continuation of each other. Mm-hmm. It's just one is a uh, not well-spoken idiot, and the other one is a very eloquent, educated man. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a kinder, gentler, more intelligent face to it. So, I, I don't know. I can see there being that. And there are, I, I don't know if you've seen, uh, just an absolutely large amount of uh, very negative reaction to Bernie running from the left, from the far left. There's a lot of it. A lot of saying that he's a distraction from things that really matter, like politics on the ground and whatnot. And mm, Yeah, I think we should talk about that because yeah. I know... The, there are, I mean, you and I happen to be in this camp of socialists that are excited to see Bernie run and, and are glad for it and, and think it's a good thing. Um, however, that is, 
you know, that is not the view of every socialist out there. Um, and, and maybe we should talk about that to represent that view a little bit, even though we're not part of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know where to begin with that. I guess maybe with what I had said, the people who find it just a distraction from Black Lives Matter, um, I've even seen Occupy Wall Street, even though I don't know how that's a thing people are worried about anymore, because Occupy Wall Street basically been gone for we could do a whole episode on Occupy Wall Street. I have yeah. I have some issues with Occupy Wall Street. Or we've talked about it a bit about it before. Yep. Um at the very at the very least the they're not in national headlines. It's you know, I you know, you have to look them up if you want to see what they're doing these days. Like it's not something it's not something that's making newspapers or Right. Or and it was a NPR. conscious choice on their part. Because they didn't, you know, Occupy chose to not take an, a position or have a platform. And mm -hmm. that's sort of what you get then is you just... Anyway, not to crap on Occupy Wall Street. They've done some good things. Um, but the, the argument is that, you know, he takes away from that sort of stuff. And I guess... In the sense that maybe some of those people, instead of being on the street protesting about, I guess the big one I can think of now is the Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. that they might be out, you know, I don't know, going door to door or trying to get people to vote for Bernie, but I, I don't, I guess I don't understand the argument, uh, why those are, uh, antithetical to each other. Yeah. Because in a large way they can go hand in hand with each other. Because, I mean, not only can they go hand in hand, but you can actually mobilize more of the progressive and liberal base, I think, with Bernie than just the far left. Or there's a potential to. Well, and I think an another thing is, you know, there's you can have the endless discussions about what's the most important thing that we can do, right? Because... This argument about what's just a distraction, I mean, it's basically saying some things, like, you could line up the importance of every single thing, and if you take that logic to the full end, then we should all des decide what the most important thing is, and then just only do that thing. Which, whatever, from a socialist perspective, means that we'd all give up everything that we're working on and just start the revolution. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that's going to happen. I mean, the, I, so... The I guess the idea that there are things that are more important than others, it's still a good idea to to have. You know, it's a personal decision that you need to make, right? Whether or not you care more about this thing or this other thing or what you personally think is the most important thing to do right now. And if you think that Black Lives Matter is more important, then by all means, that's what you should work on. Like, don't don't work on Bernie's campaign or whatever or... Or anything like that. And uh, if if you are really excited about Bernie, but you weren't excited about Black Lives Matter, then maybe that's your thing, you know? the Like, so much of this kind of work is essentially volunteer work, you know, when it comes to making the world a better place and seeing the improvements that we want to see in the world. A lot of it is all about motivating people to take their free time and donate it to, to this cause. And the most important thing when you're working with donated time is actually getting the time. And to me, the most important thing in actually getting the time is having something that people are willing to donate their time to. You know, if people enjoy it and they think it's meaningful, then that's the most important thing. That's what's going to allow you to keep building that movement. Yeah. And I think, too, there's another problem that this brings up on the left um, that just seems to be a systemic problem that I don't really understand why is always a problem, is that everybody is very issue-based, even mm. though there are lots of socialists out there doing a lot of this different stuff, and we're all aware that it is a systemic issue that has you know each thing like the black lives matter is very important 
but it is one symptom of a whole system of problems that's, you know, ties to the educational movement and other things like that, uh, prison industrial complex, military, um, it's, it's all, it's all tied together. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for people to, like on the left, there seems, to, everybody seems to be issue based. It'll be one issue and some groups might work together on this and some might not. But then like they don't, they stop working together and they move to something else. Like there needs to be a broader coalition of things. Um, like here in Wisconsin, there's the, the Young, Gifted, and Black Coalition. And what I really like about what they're doing, other than the Black Lives Matter thing, is they are tying it to education, they're tying it to prisons, you know, they're giving it a wider context um, for that. And I think that sort of work is very important. I think that's something that, you know, you can work towards building a movement around something like an electoral campaign, especially because electoral campaigns focus on multiple issues, and you can work towards maybe starting a th actual viable third-party option off of something like that. Yeah, I think that's the other thing that that can happen when you start talking about electoral politics, especially it's interesting, like we mentioned, that Bernie's running under the Democratic Party for, for this election. Because you had mentioned that you were a little bit sad to see that happen. Because I think the the alternative is to have him run as an independent which pro probably he would do, or, I mean, the other thing that socialists might ask for is to start building up a socialist party, either one of the existing ones or a new one that can, you know, get candidates elected. Right. And I think that's a good idea, too. It's just all, you know, where can you make the biggest difference right now? So yeah. I'm not, you know, I can't say that I think that's a bad idea, especially you know, like in in very in areas where that is more likely to happen. Like, turns out Seattle was the right place for Kashama Sawant, but it doesn't make like if if you're in a different place that would not elect her, it might make more sense to do a more incremental step. So you have to analyze the situation for that particular area and that particular moment. Yeah. To decide decide what what's gonna make the most sense to you, where 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 can you actually win? Because that's the other thing is, I mean, I guess sometimes when you lose a campaign, you can still win because you brought up issues, or you changed the debate, or you made connections with all the groups that worked on it with you. So there's not a total loss there, but you have to decide, you know. All considering all the benefits and all the losses, which which one would you rather do? And probably you won't know. I mean, that's that's the, the other thing is you never know what's the right thing to do until you've tried them both, yeah. and and only then can you start adding them up. And many of the benefits and losses aren't numerical, so there's not really a good way to add them up either. Yeah, I think I'm trying to remember, and some of the other criticisms from the left, other than is that there's just some some people on the left just think that electoral politics it's essentially corrupt and there's you don't really get a vote and so there's no point in bothering with them and well those are both very good points there is massive corruption and legal corruption too with citizens united and other decisions like that and in large part, it is a choice between the Democrat, who's meh at best, and the Republican, who's terrible. I mean, I, I think, I, I really empathize with that, but I just, I don't know, just completely disconnecting from it, and like not doing any of that sort of seems to be, to be missing a bit of a point, and that is that the people who are in, you know, Congress or the White House may be corrupt and crappy, but they're also the people who pass laws. So you can't completely ignore that because they're a huge lover of power. You got to, you know, you can't, I don't think you can completely disengage with that no matter how crappy it is. I mean, I think it's right to call it out for what it is, but... Yeah. 
I think just sort of pretending it's not there and something to not do is more wishful thinking than an actual strategy. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I think, I mean, uh, so I'm not going to say that everyone needs to be 100% involved in all political goings on. I like to just turn off the news for a week sometimes and just not bother with it. Just I'll listen to entertainment podcasts for a whole week and not even worry about what's going on in the world because I just need a break sometimes. And I think that that's fine. But to do things like this whole idea where you're going to be completely pure by not engaging in the electoral process, you're not even going to vote because you've decided the whole system is corrupt and you don't want to be involved in any way with something corrupt. I mean, I think what you're doing basically is giving up your small amount of power that you did have. Now, relying entirely on that small amount of power, saying, I'm not going to do anything because I'm just going to go and vote and then I'll go home and that's the thing I'm going to do. I think that's also a mistake. But, you know, swinging by your voting place and taking whatever, for me it only takes five minutes to vote, to give up that, you know, that that's not a big investment to go vote someplace. You know, so I I think my personal thought is that giving up your vote is is giving up power that has a small amount of investment time. You know, very few drawbacks when it comes to voting. Yeah. But uh, and and I mean the other thing is, if you're going to not engage in anything that has any issues whatsoever, you're only going to do things that are completely pure. I mean. You probably, I mean, unions have issues and so do, so does every political party and so do activist groups. You know, you're never going to find like the group that agrees with you 100% on everything. And if you do, then you might not like the strategic decisions they make or whatever. You know, it's there, there is place to, there's there's room in the world for you to work on things that are really good but not perfect. Yeah. That's that's my take on it. At least that's 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 how I have chosen to live my life. <laughs> yeah. I don't I think you hit though on one of I think perhaps for me the most exciting part of Bernie running and that is is that you know, everything doesn't have to be and shouldn't be only electoral politics. And that is, with Bernie running, the biggest boon is that he's not shirking away from being called a socialist. Like most Democrats, you call them and say, oh, what do you mean? I'm not a socialist. I'd shoot a commie right here if you, you know. Like, there, there's still that big fear of the Cold War and all that sort of nonsense. But Bernie's not shying away from that. And even though his definition of socialism isn't exactly what probably most people call themselves socialists would necessarily agree with, it is a great starting point to talk to people about socialism in a way that isn't with this Cold War paranoia. And it's also, uh, him running as a Democrat, is a way to reach the progressive and liberal people who are to the right of the socialists but might only be to the right of us because they don't know that there's more to the left that they actually agree with. Mm-hmm. And I think that this, that the biggest benefit is that it opens up an opportunity to try and organize more on the left and gather more people who actually would identify with the socialist if they knew it is. And then maybe, you know, 2020 elections, maybe by that point we've created a movement big enough that we can have a socialist party, either one of the current ones that exists or just a new party or a labor party or something. Like mm-hmm. It opens the door to introducing so much of the public to a social, more socialist critique and actually exposing it to them and getting them interested in it that, you know, whether Bernie win or lose, that 
you can start working on things beyond just electoral politics with a much larger group of people, hopefully beyond that. Yep. That's where the real, I think the biggest value is, unless he gets elected, in which case. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, like you were saying, I agree. I, I think one of the most exciting things about this is that there's going to be a bunch of people who get their media from a national source, like a, a national TV network or something like that who will see a socialist politician for the first time, listen to him speak, and agree with him on many things, or maybe just a few things, but that's something that hasn't happened in this country in a long time. I mean, since we had TV, right? Like, (laughs) I don't know when the last time that, I mean, we just have never had, as far as I know, a socialist uh, or a presidential candidate who identifies as a socialist speaking on TV. And that's that's pretty exciting, I think, because it's going to give a chance for people to see someone who says, "Yes, I am a socialist. These are the thing. These are some of the things I think are good ideas, and people are going to agree with some of those ideas." And I think that's really good for the future of socialism. Now I'm wondering if Norman Thomas ever uh, was ever interviewed regularly or like by regular news media. Who's Norman Thomas? Norman Thomas is the guy who became the, the socialist presidential candidate. Let's see, according to Wikipedia, six times presidential candidate for the Socialist Party of America after Debs. Oh, because when Debs was running, there was no TV, right? Right, yeah. His last election was around World War One, I, I believe. Okay. You know, now that we've gotten to the end of this, I've done this a few times already, so maybe I'm going to sound like a broken record. But I'm actually curious what our audience thinks about Bernie Sanders' run. Are are you folks excited about it? Um, do you think it's an awful thing? Do you think it's a distraction? Do you just not care about it? Um, what stance do you take on what socialists should or shouldn't do for electoral politics? Yeah, and I'll put up a couple. I've read... A few really good um, articles saying why Bernie's run is important and uh, saying some more arguments uh, for him running with going up against the against ones. I'll put up a few of those because I think they're really good and probably much more eloquently written than I can speak. (laughs) Ah, Okay, great. I look forward to it. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA, and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at RedWagner2, that's the number 2, and SchmidtAJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash dsamadison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.